Welcome everybody to the uh, regular meeting of the Planning Commission for September 20th, 2022. Uh, we will start with uh, Pledge of Allegiance and I've asked Jason Anderson to do that. And Randy, if you could raise a flag and if everybody could mute themselves when they do this. Thank you. Ready, Steve. <clears throat> Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we'll go ahead and have a roll call. Jessica, would you mind doing that, please? Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just now logging on. Um, I'm filling in for Annette, so um, any voting, um, I might ask you to repeat your names if I don't catch it. Um, okay. So for roll call, um, Commissioner Anderson? Here. Commissioner Carranza? Is that an, an absence? Yeah, she has an excused absence. Okay. Commissioner Heath? Here. Commissioner Hughes? Present. Chairperson Vanden Nykoff? Here. And then I also have an excused absence for Commissioner Schmidt and Vice Chairperson King. So that is four present and three absent. Great. Thank you. And Bill, I don't know if we need to say it now, but I think in this case, we do need a certain vote to pass items, not just the majority of those present. Is that correct? Since we do have quite a few people absent. Let me keep yeah, on that. We had that happen earlier um, on one of our previous meetings where it was like the majority of the total numbers of members. Yeah, I believe that's correct. So any item before us would have to be a unanimous vote to um, to be passed or you could continue it to a later meeting. One more. Oh yes, yeah. so we can still take an action. It just has to be in this case unanimous, you're right. Yes. I was thinking that we couldn't take an action at all. I thought that you were referring to that, but no, that's correct. That is right. Mm -hmm. So um, you must all read each other's minds <laughs> and think the same, but you don't all have to agree. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and this gets continued. So let's proceed. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the agenda, please? So moved. Second. Yes, I can, can I get oh, a... Yes. Uh, Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Heath? Yes. Commissioner Hughes? Yes. Chairperson Vanden Eickhoff? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, enter the public comment portion of the meeting, which is reserved for persons who would like to, to, to um, address the commission on any item which we might have jurisdiction but is not on the current agenda. Uh, speakers are limited to three minutes. If you please state your name for the record before making your presentation. And the commission may take action to direct staff to place a matter of business on the future agenda. Is there anybody in the uh, that's attendee that would like to make a uh, public comment on something that is not on the agenda? And if you'd like to, you can raise your hand in Zoom, or if you're on the phone, it's star nine. I do not see anybody wishing to make public comment at this time. Yeah, I see that as well. Okay, then we'll go ahead and close public comment. And um, can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar, please? All motion. Um, I'll second. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Heath? Yes. Commissioner Hughes? Yes. Chairperson Vanden Eickhoff? Yes. Motion passes. Great, it doesn't look like we have any planning commission business or community development staff reports. So we'll go ahead and um, move into the public hearing. We have two items tonight. Excuse me while I get my things here figured out. Um, 
For each of the following items, the public will be given the opportunity to speak. After a staff report, the chair will open a public hearing and invite the applicant or the applicant's representative to make any comments. Members of the public will be invited to provide testimony to the commission following the applicant. Speaker should state their name for the record and can address the commission for three minutes. After all public comments have been received, the public hearing will be closed and the commission will discuss the item and take appropriate actions. Uh, we'll move on to item number two, and which is conditional use permit for 13505 Santa Lucia Road. And before we do that, if I can get um, any disclosures of ex parte on this item, uh, we'll start with Jason. Uh, no ex parte. Okay. Greg? Uh, no ex parte. Uh, Randy? No ex parte. And I have none as well. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to the staff for the staff presentation. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here. What's happening? Oh, there we go. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, this is for an oversized accessory structure at 13505 Santa Lucia Road. This property is zoned residential suburban. Um, you can see it's surrounded by residential suburban and then it's actually bordered by uh, a paper road that goes there behind it and then unincorporated land, which is part of the county. The lot size itself is about 1.77 acres. So here we can see an aerial image of the property. Um, the existing residence is close to the road there along Santa Lucia. And then the proposed structure would be located just behind the residence. The project being proposed is to construct a 1,286 square foot detached two car garage that would also include a workshop, a half bathroom and um, a covered patio that's attached to the residence. And then there's a small covered patio on the back of the structure as well. The zoning code limits accessory structures to half the size of the primary structure without approval of a use permit. The existing primary residence is about 1,600 square feet, so the fact that this is almost 1,300 square feet exceeds that 50% limit. So the municipal code allows for oversized accessory structures to go through an administrative level use permit if they can meet all of a certain set of criteria in the code. However, this project does not meet one criteria, and therefore it has to come before the Planning Commission for a conditional use permit. And that is that this accessory structure is located on what we call a non-conforming lot. So a non-conforming lot is a lot that is below the, max, uh, below the minimum size that's required in that zoning district. So in the residential suburban zoning district, the minimum lot size starts at two and a half acres and usually increases based on a series of criteria. This uh, property is 1.77 acres, so we call it legal non-conforming. So it probably existed prior to our current zoning regulations, or it could be um, an original lot with the city. Therefore, the property can be developed per the zoning code standards, but it can't be split any further. So anyway, here is a site plan of the proposed project. You can see, um, like I'd mentioned before, it's located sort of behind the residence and then off to the side. The setbacks do meet the minimum setback requirements for a structure in the residential suburban zoning district. The typical setbacks are 25 feet from the front, five from the sides, and then 10 from the rear. And you can see this um, exceeds those by a long shot. The front is over 100 feet back, the side is over 40, and then it's even greater distance to the other side and um, the rear property lines. There will be a retaining wall behind this structure um, to account for the slope of the site, but this will be primarily hidden behind the new structure from San Lucia Road. So here we can see um, the elevations of the structure, the, uh, the height to the Top of the structure is about 17 and a half feet, and then to the eaves, it would be about 10 feet. Mm -hmm. 
Here are the south facing elevations and then the north facing elevations, but the top elevation you see here would be what you'd see from um, Santa Lucia Road. So here's the location that you would see it um, from the street. It will match the existing residence, the exact colors with the siding and the white trim with the matching roof line. So it'll look almost like an extension of that existing house there. And this is just a little bit of a better um, picture of the residence there. Um, so again, it will match perfectly and just look like an extension of the residence. The project does qualify for a class three categorical exemption from CEQA for construction of a small accessory structure. The conditions of approval that staff has placed on this project are that the architectural elevations be consistent with what the applicant provided. The exterior building and roof materials should be a dark neutral color to match the existing residence. And then the building shall include that horizontal siding again to match the existing residence. The height should be consistent with what was proposed by the applicant. And then since the applicant is proposing a bathroom within the structure, um, we will require that with the building permit submittal, we'll record a deed restriction, just stating that that um, structure will not be converted without permits to um, some kind of living unit or for overnight stays or accessory dwelling unit. Um, the required findings are the standard required findings, and those are listed out in your staff report for a conditional use permit. Staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission adopt the draft resolution for use 2022, or use 220073, allowing the construction of an oversized accessory structure at 13505 Santa Lucia Road as conditioned. As always, the Planning Commission can make modifications to the project. The Planning, the planning Commission can, make, um, can determine that more information is needed and refer the item back to staff. And finally, the third option is that the Planning Commission may deny the project. And staff is available for questions. Mariah. Mute myself. Thank you, Mariah. Um, any questions of staff? Jason, yeah. raise your hand. Have there been any, any objections to this uh, project? We haven't received any public comment up to this point. Okay. Great. Thank you. I have a question, Mariah. Um, does this impact their septic system at all or where they can locate their leach fields in the future or? Um, so you can see the septic is located up here along the front. It's really hard to see along the front of the property here. Yep. Um, they do have to relocate their propane tank, but this structure does not impact the septic. Okay. 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 Any other questions? Uh, Randy. So um, I noticed that they already have like an outdoor enclosure and like a C train. So is part of the reason for this project to be like replacing that or, or is this an addition? Um, so that's the intent. They do have a little structure there now that will, um, I believe it will go away with the construction of this project. I don't think there's a place for it. Um, and then the intent of this project is to move everything that's in that cargo container into the sure um and remove the cargo container and that's actually something that's a standard um item that we typically look at with building permits is that any cargo containers specifically are removed prior to final of new structures okay just wanted to make sure that it's not going to be like an addition on addition to where it becomes like a junkyard sure so, okay mm -hmm. any other questions of staff we go ahead and open it up to the open the public hearing and invite the the owner or the owner's app um, representative to make a presentation to us if they'd like or talk to us. I think um, Kevin, if you'd like to speak, you can go ahead and use the raise hand function if you're on your computer.
I think it shows you muted, Kevin. Yeah, there, there we go. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, we're not hearing you. Unfortunately, it looks like your, the mic is not working. If you want, Kevin, there is a call-in number on the agenda. If you can call in on your cell phone um, or on your phone. And you can also, um, if that doesn't work, you can also just call one of us. You can call me on my on my cell phone and I can broadcast that through. I've done that before if nothing else works. But um, And you can also email us to let us know if everything's okay or not and several different options we'll give you we'll give you some time to weigh in okay while we're waiting for kevin while we go ahead and open it up for any others in the uh, public that would like to comment on this item they could raise their hand if, or if they're on the phone they could hit star nine Okay, it doesn't look like we have any additional public comment. Kevin, if, um, yeah, Randy, did you raise oh, your hand? Uh, yeah, I was gonna ask um, if, um, is there any way that maybe he can type in on here or is it, or are we, just at the point where we're about to close it. I don't think he can. I don't think we have that okay. function in this meeting to be able to do okay. share comments. But yeah, um, he can always he can always text me on my phone. Um, okay. So um, or actually, better yet, just to email either Mariah or myself, you can email me right right now. I can dictate any written comments at um, pdunsmore at atascadero.org. And the P. Dunsmore is just P-D-U-N-S-M-O-R-E at atascadero.org. If you want to shoot over a quick note, then um, I can at least dictate in your comments into the hearing. Um, what well, we'd really like not, to know is if there's if there's any objections to any of the things that the staff has said or any changes. If he wants to withdraw his application um, after we approve it, then then that's okay. But other than any that anything like that, I don't think we need to to wait for him to move ahead i think yeah i think we should just motion for it yeah okay I'll motion wait, wait wait hold on <laughs> we'll go ahead and close the public comment portion of the meeting and is there any additional any anything else that anybody would like to say or make a motion at this time okay randy go ahead all right, so I'm motioning the staff recommendation, the planning commission adopt draft resolution, approving use permit, conditioning uh -huh. use permit use 22-0073, allowing the construction of an oversized accessory structure at 13505 Santa Lucia Road as conditioned. I would second that. Okay, Jessica, roll call, please. Uh, yes, I didn't catch you second. Great. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Heath? Yes. Commissioner Hughes? Yes. Chairperson Van Den Eickhoff? Yes. Motion passes. 
Thank you. Graduate. Oh, you, you got everything you wanted there. So. Yeah. Good luck on your retaining wall. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> um, Samurai, if you want to remove Kevin from the conversation on our screen, so great. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move to the second item on the, the agenda, which is conditional use permit for 10875 Colorado Road. And before we start, if we can get any uh, disclosures of ex parte, we'll start with Jason. Uh, no ex parte. Greg? No ex parte. Randy? No ex parte. And there, I have none as well. So we'll go ahead and turn this over to staff for the staff presentation. Okay, thank you. So this is for a new um, dog breeding operation slash kennel conditional use permit at 10875 Colorado Road. The project is located in the residential suburban zoning district, um, similar to the last one. The project is also surrounded by residential suburban. And this lot size is just over, over one acre at 1.06 acres. <laughs> So we can see an aerial image of the property. Um, it's just in front of two other flag lots behind it, um, but you can see the existing residence there in the middle of the site. And then the kennels are located to the north, um, sort of between those trees. A little bit of history about this project. Um, the applicants purchased this property in 2021 with an intent to breed their dogs. The, they approached the County Animal Services and they were actually issued a hobby breeder per, permit from the Slow County Animal Services without city approval. Um, typically, Animal Services is required to come to the city to make sure that it's okay with us before issuing any kind of breeding licenses, but um, that unfortunately was missed in this case. They were issued the hobby breeder license and then staff was, a made, was made aware of the intent to operate this breeding facility or breeding business. Uh, after being notified of the use permit requirement, the applicants did apply for the conditional use permit, which brings us here to tonight. The proposal is for a 300 96 square foot outdoor dog kennel. Um, the applicants built the dog kennel. Again, they were given the dog breeding license from the county and um, they weren't aware that they needed a building permit for any structure over 120 square feet. So that kennel has been constructed, but the applicant has also going through our building permit process currently. The proposal is for a maximum of four puppy litters per year. The applicant is requesting a maximum of 10 dogs on site at one time. Um, dogs in this case is referring to dogs that are over four months of age, so this doesn't include small puppies. The applicant breeds Decker Rat Terriers and Old Dominion Terriers. And this is not a commercial kennel where uh, outside dogs are being boarded or trained. This is just for their animals to stay on site and be bred. The municipal code um, limits the number, number of dogs at any single family dwelling to no more than three dogs, four months of age or three dog limit. And the municipal code allows for dog kennels, including those used for dog breeding in the residential suburban zone with approval of a conditional use permit. So this conditional use permit is both for having more than three dogs on site as well as um, commercial breeding. And in this case, commercial breeding is just referencing um, any kind of breeding operation where the applicant is making money off of the um, dog breeding. And here's the um, exact definition of a kennel 
it's essentially what I just explained, four or more dogs, um, including keeping animals for commercial breeding. The, um, again, this is going over what I just explained, but the, this is what the conditional use permit is for, for having over three dogs, commercial breeding. They currently have five dogs um, and they do intend to sell the puppies commercially, not, not their personal dogs, but the puppies. Um, they are requesting up to 10 dogs at one time and up to four litters per year. Um, the applicant can probably explain it a little bit better than I can as far as where that number 10 came from, but um, essentially the idea is to keep their five dogs that they have now. I believe they have four females and one male. Um, as those dogs have puppies, they would keep the female puppies. Um, they would grow up and grow old enough to be bred themselves and then the older females would be rehomed um, when they're no longer able to be bred. So the overlap is where that 10 dog number comes from. So staff's conditions relating to the operation is that there shall only be one litter of puppies on site at one time. The house shall remain the applicant's primary place of residence. The facility can't be used for public boarding, for public breeding, or for training, and the applicants must continuously operate in compliance with the slow county animal service laws. Um, so as I'd mentioned before, the kennel facilities have already been constructed. These are about 33 feet long and 12 feet wide. They're approximately 10, I mean, approximately five feet tall. The um, backs and sides, or the back facing um, Colorado Road and the sides of the structure are wrapped in the Corton uh, steel metal. So you won't be able to see the dogs from the, um, from the street and um, the only openings there are facing that flag lot to the back of the property. However, the applicant did just recently construct this six foot tall fence, um, just going around those kennels to reduce visibility of the dogs while they're in their kennels, um, as well as act as a little bit of a noise buffer um, by adding a, a little bit uh, more shielding to those kennels. They do have um, this existing small chain link fence kennel that is to re Main. The, can, the County Animal Services has a couple different levels of breeding. Currently, the applicant has been um, issued a license to do hobby breeding, which my understanding is more small scale. Um, with this conditional use permit, if we allow more dogs on site, they may be able to do a larger, more commercial, according to Animal Services definition, operation and one of the requirements from animal services is that they keep this um, sort of isolation kennel. It's my understanding that this is for um, if dogs are sick or need to be isolated in some way. So that's why the applicant is keeping this on site as well. So the code does have specific requirements that apply to kennels. The first one is that the minimum lot size to even consider a kennel is one acre. Um, this lot was split as a part of a parcel map and according to that parcel map, the lot is just over one acre at 1.06 acres. There are specific setbacks that are also required. Um, those would be 50 feet in the front and 25 feet on the sides and rear. And these facilities do meet those setback requirements. Um, they're 50 feet from the front property line, 39 feet from the adjacent access way or that flag lot, um, 55 feet from the rear property line and 33 feet away from the applicant's actual garage. So the applicant is proposing a phased plan here. Um, the new five foot fence 
I'm sorry, phase one includes a new five foot fence around the front of the property here in yellow. Um, that is a steel pipe fence that would um, act as a barrier for the dogs to be let out and actually run in. Um, phase two includes this whole fencing uh, in the orange here. This is a six foot tall fence. Um, this fence along the corner here is a six foot tall solid fence, whereas the rest of the property is um, not proposed to be solid. And then phase three finally is this uh, fence here in the front. Again, that would match the steel pipe fence here and um, wouldn't really screen anything uh, relating to the kennels. So staff has added some conditions relating to the timing of these phases. The first one is that um, the new five foot fence around the front property is to be complete prior to issuing a business license. Um, this needs to be in place to ensure that the dogs will have a place to be let out and meet the setback standards of the code. Um, the new six foot tall solid fencing around that back corner is conditioned to be completed within six months of um, the issuance of their business license. And then finally, the five foot fence around the rest of the property, um, including the back here and then around the front, they have much less of an impact on the health and safety concerns. So staff actually hasn't added any kind of timelines for those to be finished in. Um, the property, it's a little bit unique in that it's higher on the side with the kennels and then it dips down pretty significantly here. So the fence along this back corner will help to um, block the view and negative impacts of the kennels from the neighbor behind and to the side, whereas the fence along um, these sides has less of an impact due to the topography. Um, the applicant also plans to build a small puppy pen um, after the re this rear corner fence is built. These puppies will be kept in the pen during the day once they're five weeks old and they won't be visible from the street or adjacent property properties and the puppies will be kept in the garage at night. The adult dogs are kept in their kennels during the day and will be turned out to run in the large fenced area of the property. All, the, the, all of the dogs currently sleep indoors at night. So relating to concerns about um, noise and operation, staff has added conditions such as outside animal enclosure shall not be used for overnight boarding. So the animals will have to sleep inside or in the garage. Um, dogs will only be allowed outside between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Um, these hours go along with our noise ordinance, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And then dogs shall be contained in pens or runs and shall not be allowed to run free outside of the fenced area. So outside of that front designated fenced area that meets the setback standards of the code. So the applicant um, is aware that noise is a concern, so they um, addressed it in their application. The, they made us aware that the dogs are a special line of rat terrier that has what's called the Basenji breed bred into it. Um, this dog is unique as opposed to other dogs. It's known as a barkless dog, um, while other dogs or while these dogs do bark, it's typically a softer bark. Um, they typically bark at wildlife or visitors coming up the driveway, but um, it's said to be less than normal dog barking. The applicants also use bark collars to train the dogs not to bark, and they also have cameras going at all times to know where the dogs are being kept, or to know where the dogs are, to know where they are, and to know when the dogs are barking. So these are the noise standards um, listed our, in our municipal code here at the top. So the hourly equivalent sound level, this is the average sound level. Um, 
from the hours of 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. is 50 decibels, and at nighttime from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. it's 45. The maximum decibel, so this is sort of loud but not continuous noise, um, during the daytime maximum is 70 decibels, and then during the nighttime is 65. So um, it's hard sometimes to know exactly what this means. Uh, so I did put a chart here around 50, that's sort of the sound of a dishwasher in the next room. Once you get to 70, that's a vacuum cleaner at 3 a.m. Um, 90, you're getting closer to a lawnmower at 1 a.m. Um, so these sound levels, or so sound levels of dogs are said to range between 85 and 122 decibels when they're in kennels, and that's also because the kennels um, can amplify the noise. So that is one of the reasons that staff put that condition that the dogs will not sleep in the kennels and that they will not be allowed in the kennels from the hours of 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, to reduce some of the noise factors of the neighborhood. Staff also added a condition that the dogs are limited to these two breeds being proposed, the Decker Rat Terrier Terriers and the Old Dominion Terriers, um, and the dogs are limited to 50 pounds and below. So in that case, if the applicants or if future owners that buy the property want to continue the business with other breeds or bigger breeds, they'll need to actually come back to the Planning Commission and amend their conditional use permit. So the, um, the Planning Commission must make findings in order to approve the project that the proposed project is consistent with the general plan and zoning ordinance. Um, one of the biggest findings that the Planning Commission will need to make tonight is that this um, proposal is consistent with the character of the surrounding neighborhood. The character of the neighborhood is dominated by single-family residences. Um, breeding and having more dogs at this scale will introduce a new quasi-commercial use into the neighborhood. Um, the applicant will be required to get a home occupation business license. Home occupation licenses require that um, the business is not creating excessive noise, smells, traffic, et cetera, and require that the home occupation not change the character of the neighborhood. So the primary question for the Planning Commission tonight is if the proposed project meets um, required finding number four for, the, for neighborhood compatibility. Um, be aware that if the Planning Commission denies the, pro the permit, the owners will be required to rehome two of their existing dogs since the maximum allowed by our code is three. Um, so they'll have to go down to the three dogs and they will not be able to breed those remaining three at any time. Conditions have been added to draft resolution A to help attain compatibility of the site. Um, the Planning Commission may identify and add other conditions should they be necessary to support the findings for approval. The project qualifies for a Class 1 categorical exemption from CEQA for a minor expansion of an existing use. Um, most of the conditions of approval we did go over throughout the presentation. They were also sent to you um, in addition to the staff report. Um, I think the one that I did not mention specifically but is on here is that the um, condition number 12B um, requires that dogs should only be allowed outdoors when one or more of the property owners are present on the subject property. Um, I just wanted to highlight that so the dogs would only be allowed to be outside when the owners are home. Um, and then I did also want to correct number 19. Um, as I'd mentioned, this permit is only good for the two dog breeds proposed and they shall not exceed 50 pounds. Somehow the word not got in there, which is saying exactly the opposite of the intent. So um, staff is proposing a change to remove the word not from condition number 19. Um, another condition that we sometimes put on permits like these are the no, condition number 20, 
The use permit shall be subject to additional review upon receipt of noise or operational complaints. Additional mitigation may be warranted upon verification of recurring noise or operational disturbances that impact the residential properties. So if we are getting continuous um, complaints and we're finding them valid, we can come back to the applicant and we may have to um, add some more conditions to their permit. So again, here are the required findings. They're the standard findings for the conditional use permit, but I do want to highlight condition number four, that the proposed use is consistent with the character and orderly development of the neighborhood. So staff's recommendation is to um, either adopt resolution A, approving the conditional use permit for the dog breeding kennel project, subject to findings and conditions of approval, or to adopt resolution B, which would deny the conditional use permit for dog breeding slash the kennel project based on findings. The alternatives here are that the Planning Commission can adopt draft resolution A to approve the conditional use permit. Findings must be made to support the use permit and conditions may be added to enhance the project's compatibility with the general plan and with the neighborhood. The second option is that the Planning Commission can adopt draft resolution B and deny the requested conditional use permit. The Commission must, steerly, uh, with, must clearly state which finding cannot be made for the record and the evidence to support that finding. And finally, the third is that the Planning Commission may continue the project to a later hearing and request that staff and the applicant provide additional information. The Commission should clearly state what information is needed if this um, option is chosen. And with that, staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mariah. Any questions of staff? Jason. I have, I have a question. Um, what are the differences um, that they're asking for in this particular use permit uh, from any other animal or breeding on this on this lot um, you know where would something like this be appropriate can, as opposed to where it's being proposed um so i think i think part of that is for the planning commission to determine if this is an appropriate location um, looking back, and maybe Kelly and Phil know of more at the history of kennels, um, I believe the only one I could find in recent history was on Old Morrow Road, um, and it was a, a larger property um, out there, but that's all I could find for past kennels. Yeah, this type this type of kennel is not is not very frequent. Um, typically, when you hear the word kennel, you think of a, a large operation where someone is watching dogs when people go on vacation, and this is not that. I mean, we have one of those just outside of town, um, but we don't have any of those in in the community. And a lot of these smaller operations, because they have so few dogs, they fall under the radar, and the city never knows about them. So okay. that's it. Randy. All right, I have two questions for staff. Um, first is I just want to make sure that I read correct that the requirement of land spacing for a project like this was one acre and this is 1.06. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, wow, this is a complicated one. Um, as far as from what I understand the situation, it looks like they felt like they had a green light through the county. So they got some stamp of approval to be able to say, hey, you could breed animals, right? And with that, I mean, in this process, do we have any process towards when the county makes moves like this where we are no getting notified of it for like future reference? Or is this the first time this has happened? Let me speak to that for just a moment. Um, so the county animal control department is essentially our animal control department for the city. We contract with them to do our services. We okay. actually pay them an annual fee to do those services. And... Mm -hmm it's basically a kind of an arm of our city as a, as, as a separate entity. Um, so they do have the authority to do this. Um, unfortunately, you know, through COVID with new staff, they have made some errors and they issued a couple of permits in a couple of different scenarios where they, you know, the applicant should have gotten a conditional use permit. 
that's since been corrected. We've since had conversations with animal control and we hope yeah. that won't continue. But unfortunately, yeah, these folks that are doing this kennel did the right thing. They went to the right agency to get their permit. They were granted that approval. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you know, they were just given the wrong information by that agency and no fault of their own. They were simply trying to do the right thing. So yeah. it's an unfortunate mistake that it happened that way. And it really should start here. And in fact, in our municipal code, it describes this whole process, you know, whereas they need to get the conditional use permit first and then achieve the county animal permit. Um, or they could, you know, at least get it them done almost simultaneously. So yeah, yeah that, that issue's been taken care of. It's a it's a sticky one. Yeah, because essentially, I mean, especially because we're paying the fees and subcontracting, it is almost like a direct form of our, you know, of us giving kind of a stamp of approval, but because of our own miscommunication, now it's almost they're in a jumble where we might end up breaking up. I mean, I don't know how you are with your animals, but with me, like if I got told, hey, like I got to give my dog up, I, I would probably have a damn near have a heart attack. Um, so this is just, I can understand, like this could be a huge litigation problem as well with those miscommunications. Um, any other questions from, from staff? I have a question. I, I know that normally on uh, conditions, they're for building approvals, you know, things that are permanent, you know, like, um, you know, lighting or, I mean, you can even talk about um, vegetation, um, stuff that doesn't really need a whole lot of policing. But a lot of these seem to be, um, I mean, I don't know how you would police the type of breed that's being bred. What's What's the What's the city going to be doing when they get, um, are they going to have someone monitoring this or are they going to have someone available to go out if there's a complaint? I don't want to see the city have to take on a huge burden to, to police this. Do you want to address that, Phil? Or? We, so essentially, let me just, right off the top of the bat, we are complaint driven. So we don't go out and proactively enforce any conditional use permit for that matter, or any situation on properties. We instead have a react reactive code enforcement department where we go out if we receive a complaint, and quite regularly we do. We have a very long list almost every day of things to follow up on based on neighborhood complaints. So that is how this particular use permit would work. And by the breadth of the letters that you received on this particular item this evening, you can see how well that process works. We have good communication from our neighborhoods and neighbors are all watching out for each other. And that is how we follow up on these items. And yes, this would create an additional responsibility for city staff as we do receive complaints and interactions from neighbors. We do go out and we do have to negotiate with those neighbors and try and encourage compliance. And I can tell you right now, I think Mariah has already received a very substantial amount of communication and collaboration with this particular neighborhood as it, as it has been. And so, um, yeah these these things consume a lot of time yeah uh, well jason's still going uh go ahead go ahead i'm still thinking um yeah i just um I, so i mean it looks like we're also trying to kind of um manage like their their litters at a, at a time did it, did i interpret that correctly as far as like they their their breeding numbers Correct. So, um, yeah, we do have a condition that they shall only have one um, litter at a time, and that's really just to um, try and lessen the neighborhood uh, impact of having, you know, I don't know how many puppies these dogs in particular have, but if they had four litters at one time, that would be a lot of puppies in one place. So my question for staff is on this, I mean, and I, I don't have knowledge on this, is there any way to regulate when a dog goes into heat? So those are questions, and I know the applicant is going to want to talk about that. Um, so I think that's a good question for them. And then um, the other thing is they mentioned that um, this was essentially a, a rare breed, which I did look that up. It's uh, noticed by the American Kennel Club that it's cons considered a rare breed. I mean, it's got history going back to the early 1900s and the other breed uh, back to like the 1850s, it looks like. Um, 
But um, the reason I'm asking is, is, you know, a little bit I know as far as ag related, I mean, like when you start getting into things like ducks and you're like looking at West Indies compared to pentails, there's a viability as far as survival rate of offspring. And when you start dealing with rare animals, usually they're rare because their viability and the production rates lower. So I, my question for the city is if we're going to put these conditions in, how do we plan to police them? Typically how this works is um, some of these conditions do require some follow-up based on whether they have to do landscaping or construction. So before we finalize uh, the use permit, um, we need to make sure everything's in place for their business operation. But beyond yeah. that, in terms of the ongoing maintenance and quality control and all these other things you have, again, uh, we um, typically will not go out there to inspect unless there is an issue, unless we have a condition that mandates that we go out and do a regular inspection. And in some conditional use permits, we can do that. We can have an annual review. We can have a six month review. We can have a two year review. And a lot of cases with controversial topics, we have that. In fact, we have people come back to the commission to report out, how are things going? How is the neighborhood doing? What's happening? Do we need to change any conditions? Okay. That's kind of a performance condition. So these are all options, but yeah, we don't typically just go out um, once okay. everything is completed. And and yeah, and that's where my curiosity was. I mean, since they're getting a business license, usually you have to present a business plan of whatever metric you're you're dealing with. And so uh, in, their, in the business plans, do they have any criteria where they're self-reporting or is this just um, essentially if a neighbor, you know, and someone who might not get along with them, if every time they call, are we going to be out there? Yeah, so I think that's more of the way that it works, um, unless the commission actually um, incorporated a condition where we go out every certain amount of time, but otherwise um, these conditions would be added onto their business license. And then essentially if we get complaints and we find that they are in violation of these conditions, then we can revoke their business license basically. Okay. okay. I just, just an add on this. Um, this is a residential suburban lot uh, zoned kind of, um, area right mm -hmm. so normally you wouldn't be issuing business licenses to do this type of um uh, business anyway right or am i wrong about that they're usually commercial lots for commercial businesses and it's well like, it's we actually hobby, we but... actually yeah this, this kind of a business is actually something that uh could occasionally be allowed in a residential zone we also have a host of other what we call home occupations that are allowed in residential yeah. districts yeah. so we do actually issue a lot of business license in, in business licenses in residential zones um but you know a few of them come to the planning commission level this is that case so yeah you're not gonna have you're not gonna have trucks backing up and you know deliveries and stuff like that as much as like you know a storefront or, you know, no. some people will do small welding uh, production facilities in, in their at their residence and that's a, a business. But um, this is, um, you know, a different type of business. I've never dealt with um, with breeding dogs or, or what's entailed in it. And, uh, you know, considering the location, I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture without um, making approval. It's going to be a sticky mess down the road for the city to have to um try to un unring the bell, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's good that we take the discussion uh, as far as we can to, to prevent uh, making a mistake. So do you have any, uh, does the staff have any uh, um, considerations that they'd like us to review? Well, this is, this is a tough topic. And I think that's why staff presented you with uh, a very neutral position on this topic. We don't have a strong recommendation to support or deny. You notice you've got a couple different options in this report. Um, there's definitely the consideration of the neighborhood input. There is the consideration of the project conditions and whether they're satisfactory to mitigate the potential impacts of this operation. Really what it comes down to, I mean, the most, I think it's a lot of perception about noise. Is this gonna be a noisy 
thing. A lot of us have gone to kennels, which where we have our dogs when we're on vacation and they're really um, noisy. And this isn't really that kind of a kennel. It's simply, okay, there's going to be a couple of adult dogs or three or four and occasional litters of puppies. So it's pretty low scale in terms of a commercial business. It's, it's not going to be a whole lot different than someone has, you know, that has three dogs, which they're allowed to have in any property. Um, the difference here is, you know, they actually are commercially selling the puppies on occasion and that's when it rises to that level. So hopefully that helps you look at this, but yeah, this is a touchy topic. This is one that definitely evokes, um, concerns from neighbors. Okay. <clears throat> I remember, I remember when we did the, the Woods Humane Society, how, uh, uh diligent they were about. Uh, where the where the dogs would sleep and the walls between the the, the kennels and and all that stuff and it seems that um, the the Lawrence family knows a lot about uh, you know breeding dogs so I think that they've done a little bit of due diligence in that area. However, I just see all these conditions. You know, the dogs have to be here at, during the day and at, here at night, and it's just. Um, a lot of conditions on a uh, on a property would those conditions be necessarily applied if it was in more rural area so the reason for the conditions that staff put on and we really wanted to try and make the applicants project work but then also um, try and reduce the impact on the neighborhood so they are pretty tight the fact that they um, you know can't sleep outside they can only be outside during certain times um, you know obviously if if you just have a dog you don't necessarily have those conditions just as a pet but because they're wanting more dogs and wanting them for the specific purpose um, and they're in this situation for a conditional use permit we did add those conditions um, and then of course it's up to the planning commission if you think those aren't strict enough or you think they're too strict or um, you know whatever your decision may be. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Andy. So just a quick question for staff. Um, do we have any precedent where we've either approved or denied a similar project in a residential neighborhood like this? There has been uh, not in recent years however um, we don't have any examples that I can give you specifically right now that I can recall in the last five years, but I know there has been similar. Um, I don't know if Kelly recalls, she's a longest term okay. Atascadero employee out of the, the three of us, but I, yeah, don't I, I, I do believe there's sometimes some additional scrutiny on more commercial scale businesses and residential zones. So um, I don't know of any, kennels per se or, or things of that nature that have not been approved but I do know sometimes um, that in breakfast requests and you know things that have impact to the neighborhood um, are you know taken under greater consideration. And then I have one last question I just want to make sure I'm interpreting this correct it looks like five dogs is the limit so if you were to have three animals three dogs and they are not fixed one gets pregnant and you have a litter of three, you go over that five limit, are you, you're automatically in violation? No, you're allowed to have a litter of puppies and that's just okay. something you do when you have a pet animal. Yeah. Uh, but if you chose to go ahead now and sell those animals, technically you would need a business license. Okay. And then technically if you get a business license for a dog breeding situation, that would put us in the loop to go back to a use permit. So it's a little bit of a sticky situation uh, okay. if you really wanted a business license and really wanted to make it legal. But I know that, I'll tell you right now, that oftentimes people will have a litter of puppies and I'll have two or three dogs at home and I'll have a litter of puppies. And it that's just the nature of keeping pets. That happens. And I did want to note that the number of dog restrictions um, is only for adult dogs. So puppies under a certain month's age do not count towards that number. Very good point. Yeah, and the reason I ask this is uh, generally, I mean, from the feel of what I get with this project, and I've, I've had a lot of experience with people in the ag communities that tend to be particular to particular breeds, um, usually there's a very niche thing where um, people are, I mean, a lot of times these animals are already, you know, going to go to a home before they've even been born. 
Um, and especially with the fact this seems like a rare breed. I mean, that's kind of the the picture that seems to be painted here. Like these people are kind of more fanatic into it. It looks like, oh, if the numbers go over this, then we sell an occasional dog. So, I mean, I think I'm going to have to have a few questions for the applicant coming up. Okay, any other questions of staff? Okay, we'll go ahead and open up the public comment portion of the, of the meeting and we'll invite the, the applicant or the applicant's representative to address us. Okay, Nick, I went ahead and um, put you on the committee here. You just have to unmute. Hello, everyone. Uh, hi. <laughs> so we've never used Zoom before. Um, so, yeah, our we tried to go through the process before we even bought this home to see if this would be allowed in our area. We went through animal services and multiple conversations with them, and it was under my understanding that all I needed was a hobby breeder's permit. And they told me, this is animal services, they told me that I would be good under that hobby breeder's permit. And then in order to have more than the three dogs allowed, because it's not just in Atascadero, it's also in Paso, it's in, um, I believe, Pismo or Arroyo Grande, everybody has that three dog limit. But if you're in town, but all you need to do, according to them, is get a multi-animal permit on top of that hobby breeder permit. And that yep. allows you up to six dogs or six cats, whatever you have, or a combo of the two. So I thought that we were okay in that. Had I known that this was part of the process, we would have done it first. But we thought we were in, um, what? Well, in, 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 in compliance, like within yeah. compliance of the county regulations and the city, because the county was, basically guiding us at that point until we were made aware we had to go down the route of the condition, conditional use permit. So we weren't planning on getting on that scale of even up to 10 dogs. We were thinking five, six, and then it kind of turned into this is going to be a business that gets fallen under the, I don't know, category of commercial even though like to me commercial, I would think of 15 dogs, 20 dogs, you're boarding, you're training, all of that. I'm like, we're a much smaller scale. Um, and I'm not stuck on that number of 10. It was just that I'm like, I'm thinking five, six years down the road when it's time to retire those moms. And there are plenty of homes that want an, an older dog. They don't want a puppy. They want a trained dog um, that they would be rehomed. And then that daughter would replace her. That's where I got that number 10 from, but at no point at this time, do I want 10 dogs on the property, um, 10 adult dogs. Um, the only thing that I had with staff recommendation was um, one litter on the ground at one time. And Mr. Hughes, I know that you were asking a question about their heat cycles. You can't control nature. That was my biggest thing. So especially with Basenjis, and one of my girls has more Basenji in her, I won't know if she's going to follow that. They only come into heat once a year. So depending on dog breed, dog size, it could be they come into heat every six months. It could be seven. It could be eight. It could be once a year. So that was a good question because that was something I was concerned with as well is if I have a female that is ready to be bred and then that next one only comes into heat once a year, I'm going to miss that whole year with her. I don't want more than two litters on the ground at one time. So that is one thing that I was asking to be changed is us to be allowed to have two litters if this passes. Okay. And then I know you had the question of the dogs and the kennels at night. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, also to add to Randy, you mentioned uh, the specific type of dog, it's, it's a total niche, you know, market. Every single dog is pre-sold. We have a waiting list that is way too long on how many dogs can actually be born. So <clears throat> if there's possible concerns of you guys or the neighbors that there's going to be 
excess puppies that won't get sold and, you know, start turning into a puppy pile on the property. That's not the case. All these dogs are pre-sold well in advance. And I just wanted to address that as uh, a possible concern with you guys and the neighbors. May I ask them a question real quick? Um, per litter, I mean, is there like an approximate amount of puppies that are like born in general on their litter cycles? Yeah, usually six to eight. Okay. Yeah. And one other uh, item I wanted to address for the Exhibit A condition was number 15, uh, stating the animals are only allowed to be kept in the kennel during the daytime hours and at nighttime we'd have to bring them in. Um, the, I really just like to see if this can be reviewed and allow us to have the dogs in overnight. I mean, there's four stalls currently right now. Uh, one dog is a house dog, so that they're not going to be double stacked for now. But um, I think limiting our ability to have the dogs not sleep in the kennel overnight would provide a, an impact just uh, to our family. And, you know, say like we, we leave for the house and we go to dinner and we come home at 930. Um, based on past neighborhoods or uh, past neighbors, we're going to be an instant complaint to the city saying we're not meeting our guidelines of uh, our curfew for our dogs, sort of say. Um, they've, they've been, they've actually slept out in the old chain link kennels we've had late at night, well into the night when we got home, sometimes 1 a.m. And they're not barking, they're not making noise. So Consideration with that, I would maybe, I'm wondering if we could be held to the same standard of if we go above noise ordinance rules or guidelines during nighttime hours, then the appropriate actions would be taken place, just like in the other uh, animal owner on this property. Because like uh, a few of you guys said, there's plenty of people in our area that have, you know, goats, sheep, you know, up to three dogs or animals. And if they make noise, then the complaints would come in and the appropriate actions would be taking place. So I would, I would hope maybe this can be considered to allow our dogs to sleep in their, basically their new homes uh, overnight. Um, because in the, in the past, they've had, we've had no complaints and they've slept through the night without making any noises. But if you guys are completely set on them being in the garage at night, we ask that we can go past that nine o'clock hour. I'm like, that puts us at, I mean, think of it. You guys go to Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner. I'm like, you're not going to get home at nine o'clock at night. You know, I'm like, and we have a neighbor that'll probably call 901. So that's where we're wondering if that, so to say, I'm like, I'm going to call it curfew can get pushed. A little bit further, maybe 10 30, 11. That way it's they're still in that nighttime, but it's not nine o'clock at night. And um, I've had over 30 years experience with terriers. Um, I was born and raised with them. We've always had them. Um, I am actually the president of the vi the vice president of the Old Dominion Terrier Club of America. I'm like, these that these dogs are my life. They're my passion. I'm like, this is not just the thing where I'm throwing a bunch of dogs in a kennel. I'm like, they, they mean a lot to me. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah. Um, why she, uh, get a little emotional on this, but I think we are these, yeah, these dogs aren't just sit in a kennel, breed them, pack them out, make money, all that kind of stuff. They, yeah. hold on. Sorry, we're we're both very passionate about our animals. We're attached to them. Um, we handpicked the girls that we have for a reason. Um, each one brings something unique. Um, these dogs come from Champion Bloodlines. Our kids love our dogs. 
The neighbors are concerned with noise. We do our best. We have had one complaint in the past year that we've been in this home, one complaint. And that was from my girl who never barks. And we went back and looked at the camera and it didn't show where it was, but we were out of town that day. So I think it's pretty impressive that one complaint with having this many dogs in a year. We have neighbors that walk by that look up on the hill and see the dogs and they have commented that they're the quietest dogs in the neighborhood. Um, we, uh, we do our best to keep that noise down. Our um, property, we're building top-notch fencing around to keep the dogs in to make it look nice. I think we wrote on there, we plan on planting shrubs and trees and different stuff along the road. I'm like, it, we're not trying to be a nuisance in our neighborhood. We're not trying to upset our neighbors. Our biggest thing is being able to have our family dogs that we love have puppies and um, be able to do it in a home that we found that we love. Nick was born and raised in Tascadero. I'm from Templeton. This this house is kind of our dream. And um, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm like, this is just, uh, we, we want to be able to have our dogs here, you know, I'm like, and if you guys bring that number down, I'm totally fine with that. The number of dogs, um, do you have anything else that you would like to say? <clears throat> um, Kind of hard to beat that but just yeah i mean you see you see no letters <clears throat> they're objective in both ways uh some public comments people say you know polar opposite of they're quiet and then you have some letters saying we're a great young family on the block and uh we just want to be cohesive in the neighborhood and it's, it feels like we're kind of being attacked by certain neighbors when we're just trying to do the right thing. I think we're going to leave it at that, you guys, unless if you have any other questions for us. Uh, commissioners, any questions? Randy, go ahead. Yeah, I do. So you guys received one noise complaint. Um, was it validated? Was Did anyone go out there and actually verify, like, did law enforcement respond or, or anything like that, like recited? Yeah, we got a call from Animal Services. And yeah. um, they had me call them back. And at the time they said it was at 1230 PM. And then I went back and looked at the cameras and then I could hear her barking and it was actually around 930 AM. So I do know that she was barking, but I can't tell at what. And it is my dog that is usually silent, which was extremely odd. So I don't know if it was a deer. Um, we later um, found out the dogs were being provoked once we put cameras up um, mm. by certain people. So um, we have seen that with cars, people in general, um, and we have video to back that up if anybody needs to see it. So were you cited? No, we weren't. Okay. And so nobody went out there and legitimately verified, hey, it's over the sound decibel. Correct. No. The reason I'm asking is that I know that you guys stated that these are uh, essentially a soft bark dog. And and um, I just want to make sure that, like, you know, if we had someone that said, hey, black and white, it's completely opposite, then we'd be aware of it. So but from what I understand, this was you guys got an informal kind of give us a call and just keep your dogs in check. Yes. Okay. And lower that. Thank you very much um, for your comments. We're gonna, we might bring you back in, but we're gonna go ahead and open it up for public. Oh, Jason, did you have something? Uh, you're muted, Jason. All right, sorry about that. I had a real quick question uh, for either Mr. or Mrs. Lawrence. Um, now you, you're training your dogs as well on the premises, right? What do you mean? Um, well, no. I, I think the, the word, the, tr the training thing would just be train, we're training them with the bark collars, like as a training tool. And if that's maybe where you got the, the training. Um, yeah, yeah. So they have bark collars on to, to prevent them from barking. I know they're, they're 
part barkless dogs, but you know, they do bark when, you know, you want a dog to bark when a, someone comes on your property. That's the whole yeah. purpose of totally. having a dog most of the time. Uh, you know, and so I'm not trying to be picky, but I, I, you know, it's like, you'll have multiple dogs and you'll be training all these dogs throughout the, the seasons. Um, do you train the puppies before you, you sell them or they're sold as puppies? Do you intend on training um, dogs? Because no. you'll have to be out there calling them. And that sometimes might increase the noise level, maybe not of barking, but of, you know, you calling the dog. I know that, uh, you know, that might be a concern. And uh, what I'm trying to do is prevent any um, um, misinformation or uh, misunderstanding on what's going to be happening on the property. To go ahead and approve this. And then we got a mess on our hands of how do we, how do we, uh, how do we roll it back? I don't want to have you guys constricted to the point where you just can't function. It would be unfair no. to you. It would be unfair to you because you know you're trying to run a business and you're trying to do things. You're trying to do good things. I love dogs. <laughs> you know, without without breeders, we don't have the great dogs that we have. So um, yeah, and I'm, I'm happy that you're doing this. Yeah. No. Um. Good question. No, we we don't train the puppies before they go. They're so small. They're eight weeks old. So they leave the house, the property at eight weeks old. So there's no additional training. And I mean, I pick which girl's going to go to the beach with me during the day. You know, I mean, we get all the name calling out when we're at the beach. So <laughs> there's, there's not any additional noise. I mean, you're going to hear me calling my kids more than the dogs. So <laughs> can't do anything about that. <laughs> right. <laughs> go ahead, Randy. Um, so you mentioned earlier that, you know, before your these, you know, puppies are, are born that you already have a list of people that are willing to accept them at a home. So do you have like an, like just an estimate or an average number of like how often, how many are being requested? Yes. So, um, currently we may have a litter due in November, possibly. Um, this dog is not even on the premises, so she, um, she lives in a different home. My mail went to her house. Um, I had a wait list, I believe of 10 people for, um, females and eight people for males. And that was without even advertising. Um, my male has over a thousand followers on Instagram. He's a pretty famous boy. Um, he's, he's my heart. Um, other than my husband and my kids, uh, no, they're just well known. And our little girl Fox, um, I have a wait list of four people that wanted a puppy from her since she was eight weeks old, and I brought her home. So that's without even seeing her full grown. Okay, so the reason I'm asking is, you know, if if we comply with your acquiesce as far as allowing, you know, two litters, I just mm -hmm. want to make sure that you know, if you had two litters of six, you're not automatically way over at a point where now if you have our time getting, you know, finding homes for them. So I just want to make sure that you don't end up, you know, on, on accidentally stockpiling. Like I get your business plan as far as, you know, it's, it, you want to be kind of humane with your animals. You don't want to breed them into the ground. You want to naturally have one that will replace them and then have another one, you know, go to a yeah. home where they can kind of live peaceful. Yeah. I just, so that's 18, 18 people that are already, you know, backlisted and that's without you guys marketing. So that's not as much of a fear of mine now. So thank you for your answer. You're welcome. And if I don't have any interest on a certain female, I pro will probably pass her up and wait till the following year that there are people that do want a puppy from her. Cause I'm like, I don't want to be stuck in that situation where you guys are getting phone calls saying, Hey, there's all these puppies at their house. I'm like, that, that doesn't make any sense to me either. So. Thank you very much for your, your comments. Um, we'll go ahead and open it up to the public at this point. If anybody from the public would like to make a comment, if they please raise their hand in the, in, on Zoom, or if you're on the phone, if you want to hit star nine. It looks like we have our first one. Um, Hello. Yes. Hi, my name is Macy Umbertis. Um, I have known the Lawrences for many years. Um, I actually went throughout school in, in Atascadero with Nick Lawrence. Um, I also was their realtor when they purchased this property. Um, I just 
wanted to comment and say that they are born and raised here and they've always been very responsible members of our community, um, always been upstanding citizens. This is their first home and they worked very, very hard and it saved a long time to get to where they are today. Um, and when we were looking at properties, Chelsea was very cognizant of the area um, because she always wanted to have a place where, you know, it would beautify the area and she could fix up her property. Um, we looked at a lot of properties and it was all really geared towards the kids and the dogs. Um, it wasn't so much about the house, it was about the land and what they could do with it. Um, they've significantly improved this property and the overall appeal of the property for the neighborhood since they bought it. They've spent countless hours of labor cleaning up the property and um, it's really made a difference in the neighborhood. I've met with another neighbor who is thinking of listing their house on the same street and they even commented to me um, what a great job that they've done in beautifying the neighborhood and you know taking down things that weren't so visually appealing to the eye when you're driving by their house and um, they really cleaned the place up a lot and I've only seen positive improvement since they purchased the house. And I just wanted to say I'm for their kennel, kennel, their responsible homeowners and pet owners, and I hope this passes for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Quick question for Macy, I'm there. Um, so you were the representing realtor. I know that before they had purchased this property, that this was kind of a long-term ambition, and they had mentioned pretty early on that they were already contacting uh, uh, the county, essentially. Did were they already contacting before the property was purchased, the county, or yes. was it they? Oh, okay. Yes, yes, they were. Um, that was one of the things. I mean, Chelsea was kind of the research analyst <laughs> of the of the property and anything that we looked at. Um, and they were up. She was absolutely doing her homework when it came to finding the right property so that she could do this there. And she was in contact with animal services. Um, well before we closed on the property during our investigation period. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we will go to Marilyn Pearson. Remember, um, this, if that's who that name is, sometimes the name doesn't match the person. But um, if you could um, state your name and uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hey, Marilyn Peterson. And I object, I think we would need to deny this. I think it's extremely unfortunate that a mistake was made early on and that one agency said it was okay to do. But when I look at uh, the conditions of a limit of 10 dogs, I would be, I'd be inclined to, to bend the rules if it were a limit of five dogs, not, not 10 dogs, because those dogs barking, I'm, I'm less than a five minute walk and those dogs barking get our dogs barking, they get other dogs barking and it does affect the noise level. So I would vote against it. I would vote okay with it if it was changed to a maximum of five dogs, not 10 dogs. Thank you, Marilyn. Do we have any others that are on the on Zoom that would like to make a comment? Please raise your hand. Go ahead, Dave Small. If you could un unmute yourself. Okay, how's that? That's My name is Susan Small. My Susan? husband is sitting right here. And um, my husband and I walk quite often. And when we walk by the Lawrence's house, we see we see their dogs sitting there looking at us and we wave to them and we talk to them. They just look at us. They never bark with us, but then we don't have a dog with us. So they're delightful people. Their children are charming. Um, we were so excited to have a young family move here in the area. So um, I hope that you can help them out and, um, and all goes well for everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll go to the next one. Barbara Sims, if you could please unmute yourself. I did. Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Thank you. Um, let me just do a quick little backstory here. Um, the Lawrences began building these kennels in May. And in May, uh, I filed a complaint, a code enforcement complaint with the PD. And it remained, un no one did anything about it until July when I called the city and said, when is something gonna happen about this? So it was at that point, the city contacted the Lawrences and told them, you need a conditional use permit to do this. So that was a bit of an um, interesting um, thing with the city, how it happened. And he continued building them the whole time until they were finished. So now we have these kennels here. I was a bit um, surprised to find that he is asking for 10 dogs. 10 dogs next door to you or one house over from you is a nightmare. 10 dogs barking. And they say they don't bark, but I just had a neighbor next door to me that had two dogs and barked and barked and barked and barked. Um, I also don't understand why they have four kennels, but they're asking for 10 dogs. Uh, what are they, where are they gonna put them? Um, Chelsea said in her letter that this is a nice quiet neighborhood. I'd like it to remain nice and quiet. Um, animal control gave them a permit for a hobby breeding business. This is a commercial business quite clearly. Uh, 10 dogs, four litters on the ground every year. Um, this is gonna drive our property values down. I mean, who wants to buy a house that sits next to a dog kennel? Um, I'm just not good with it. Um, let me check my notes here. They currently have five dogs. If they've lived here, Kelsey's born and raised here, surely she knows the rules about having only three dogs, not five dogs. So they currently have five dogs and without a permit. Um, people up the street on Colorado, it's one of those NIMBY, uh, not in my backyard situations. As long as it's not affecting them, they're good with it. Try living around the corner two houses up, one house up from this, and it does affect us. Um, like I said, our property values will go down. Try living in close proximity to 10 dogs. I urge you to each to consider what it would be like if you lived next door or one house over from a property that had 10 dogs. And uh, like they said, this is never, can't find a, when this has happened before, um, it's a residential zone. Kennels do not belong in a residential zone. Um, thank you, Ms. Sims. There are three minutes. Thank you. Left. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have anybody else that would make, like to make a statement? Uh, the Burrells. Yes, uh, Larry Burrell. I met the Lawrences. Very nice people. This ain't an attack about people. This ain't attack about dogs. It's the, the personal aspect of what we're going to end up doing. This is, listen to us all talk. We're walking on thin ice. Do you think this is not going to create a problem? It's definitely going to create a problem. So I don't even understand. We keep using the word residential. We keep saying we're going to cut through this and work this out and make that work. Uh, you you got you people are going to open up a department just to police this. I mean that's what almost it sounds we like. We can see and hear the dogs. Also. And we hear these dogs in the past. And you know she explained to me she was I guess it was her mom's dogs and that's fine. But the point is I couldn't even sit down on the porch and I and I said to him when you hear the word kennel, what do you arrive with that? I mean it's just it's hard to take in. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, you know the old word you're saying about counting the course, the cost. I mean, these folks built the kennel. The city went over there, told them to stop. I remember the days when they used to red tag. In other words, don't continue. There's no engineering. There's nothing. I don't understand all that. But I lived that because I was in the construction business. But here we are. We're going forward with something, maybe. It just doesn't seem fair. I'm sorry that they went so far with this and I'm sorry that the, the county gave them the blessing like it can happen. And it turned in, look at what it's turning into. This is a big drama, it's going sideways. It's, it's just really sad how we all got to sit here and try to skid this out and try to make it work. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Elaine. Anybody else that would like to make a comment? Okay, we'll bring back Nick to speak, please. Hi, you guys. Um, I want to address Barbara's concern. Um, according to the county, because I asked Mariah about this, is I asked if the city has different rules and regulations on how big a kennel space needs to be per dog. So according to the county, it's the same rules as the city. The county says it has to be dogs ranging from 11 to 35 pounds require 24 square feet. So a kennel needs to be 24 square feet. We're talking six by four, eight by three, probably a six by four kennel. Our kennels are eight by 12 feet. So that puts us at 96 square feet. So my dogs range in that 35 weight limit. So we're talking 24 square feet. If you have an additional dog in that kennel, they require five extra square feet for that. So you're talking 29 square feet for to have two dogs, 30, both 35 pounds in one kennel. And again, each of our kennels are 96 square feet. We made them bigger so these dogs do have space, not to put a bunch in them, but just so they have enough space to run around. So we are on that limit. And then even if we went up over 35 pounds, the next weight limit is, um, or weight range is 36 to 50 pounds. Those dogs require 40 square feet for a kennel. So we're still way above 46 square feet. We're at 96 square feet per kennel. Um, and then since they brought up my barking dogs, the last people that just spoke, um, they have dogs that visit there and they were there all summer. And we have video of that. And I, I want to address, there was another neighbor up the street and they think that our dogs are the ones barking. Well, all summer, it was actually those neighbors that had their daughter come visit. And he told us, and they had, I think what, four dogs there. Yeah. All summer, pretty much. And they were actually the ones barking. So I think that some of the neighbors might be confused by whose dogs are actually barking at the time. And I do have videos of that as well. Um, I think that we're good. Yeah. And if I could add on just a little bit, <clears throat> this, the structure we built is a new home. It replaced these chain link kennels that, you know, you buy at Home Depot for a couple hundred dollars and they look ugly. So the, the, the name kind of like we talked about is, very obscure i i think kennel of, is a huge operation but the structure we built yeah it, you can call it a kennel but it's truly their their new home so um i just i just want to add that in there that you know we spent all the time and effort you know i truly thought i didn't need a permit <clears throat> to build this building because i thought it was an ag style structure um i i'm not sure who said it but yes the city officials came out talked to me we're going through our permit process. Once again, we're not trying to cut corners or do loopholes. So I'm following the proper steps to get the structure permitted, which is separate from the conditional use permit we're here for today. So I just want to kind of clarify that, you know, it, it seems to be they see this monstrosity of a building that looks like any other shed on the street. And it's just a really nice home for our dogs. So I just want to clarify that um what the structure actually is and we're, we're trying to do everything right to provide us a, a safe home and make it also look appealing to the rest of the neighborhood when you when you drive down the street uh, that's all i got thank you very much anybody else that would like to make any comments on this item Okay, in that case, we will close the public comment portion of the meeting, bring back to um, the commission for some deliberation. Just a reminder, um, we have to have a unanimous, unanimous vote tonight. 
unless we want to, and if we don't, uh, we might want to consider um, continuing this to a, another meeting where we'll have more planning commissioners so that um, otherwise, um, that's just a recommendation. So if we, we see that we're moving, we're not in alignment on how we want to move forward, if we might want to continue this item. Is that? And it, it could be continued to the October 4th if you're not able to come to um, a decision. Okay. If we have a standoff. In other words, yeah, it's a 3 1 or 2 2. So. Yeah. Any discussion among um, planning commissioners on the side? Real, real quick comment on uh, the restriction uh, number one on the conditional. Um, use permit uh, listing for conditions. That's redundant. Uh, it says regardless of owner. You know, I'm concerned that, you know, we might be, you know, endearing ourselves to this particular couple and their lifelong dream of, you know, breeding puppies. And then this conditional use permit will extend to the, the next owner who may just, you know, be like a puppy mill, you know. And although we have all these restrictions, I, my my main concern is, are we, do we willing to turn the city into a policing agency where they're constantly going out for these um, um, complaints, regardless of owner? And if that does take place, um, what would happen? You know, if there were excessive complaints, what would we do? Remember, we send the conditional use permit and they have to get rid of all these dogs? We do have the option to, to revoke a CUP if we hear substantial complaints. Also, it is at the commission's pleasure to alter any of these conditions, and you can issue a CUP to a specific owner. You yeah. you can actually do that. So um, those are those are options here. Maybe what would be good, um, you know, it's still we don't know which way the the commission is going to go at this point. It might be helpful though to have if Mariah is able, if we can get the conditions up on the screen. And you can kind of pick through those, you know, as you start discussing, it might help us if we start making some notes, at least on, you know, to that nature. And then you can get yourself to a motion at some point. Okay, while she's doing that, go ahead, Randy. I'll... Oh, just a quick question. Is there any way that we could condition that they have to do automatic self-reporting as far as their breed cycle? Automatic boarding. So explain that. Is there any way that that we can put in a condition where they have to automatically like report, like give the city a heads up, like every three four months? Hey, this is where we're at. We have one litter in. We only have this many dogs. Maybe I don't think we want that. I don't think we have that kind of time. Okay. To manage that. Gotcha. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just yeah, being Phil, realistic on it. Yeah. No, Phil would love to take that on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, real quick, um, I, I I think that I would like to entertain the idea of, of uh, pushing this off till our next meeting, so we can have a couple more uh, commissioners involved. Uh, many many minds make uh, for better ideas, and I would also like to recommend that because there's so many uh, letters on both sides. You know, you got neighbors that are. are Promote, uh, promoting this and saying that they're wonderful people. And I, I agree with that. I think that the wonderful people are trying to just live their dream. But then you also have people of deep concerns, legitimate concerns about, you know, um, what it's going to happen in the neighborhood. I would like to give the, uh, the applicant time to maybe uh, work out some of these issues with their neighbors and uh, um, give us some time to do a little research and uh, take this on at the next meeting, try to um, get a little few more ideas in because I don't want to make a decision too hastily. This was kind of put on us at the last minute. I didn't know anything about it until um, what was it last Thursday? We got this. And I think we got a, a large packet today. So it's a lot of informa information to make a decision on. Randy. And I'd also like to bring up a main point. I mean, a lot of this is conditional on the fact that they do get a proper business license and that they stay compliant with all these things. Um, I mean, even down to the noise complaints, I, 
we can already tell, like, I mean, just I'm trying to look at the legal area, the black and white, separate the people from the situation. And no matter what way we go on this, there's going to be most likely litigation. Now, unfortunately, in this one, though, um, if it were to fail, we already have a can of worms open because we had certain things done. Yes, we have tried to retroactively after the fact correct the future, but we already have certain things that we've done. But if it were to pass, we do have the ability and a positive reinforcement that essentially it's either going to maintain or fail based on the merit of how serious they're taking their living situation with their neighbors. And so, I mean, cutting out, you know, he said, she said, dogs bark, they've got dogs. I mean, we can go around in circles on this. I don't want people pulling out camera footage and creating a bad, uh, a bad riff with their neighbors. But unfortunately, a lot of it's already there. So we can't really fight that. So uh, I think that uh, we are getting a little crazy on it. But I did want to just mention that, I mean, at least we have a few other processes here that deal and curtail with their business because a conditional use permit, as it may be given, it shall be taken as well. Um, would somebody like to make a motion that we move this to a date certain of October of the next October meeting? I don't think we're going to come to any kind of conclusion here tonight. I, I agree with Jason that I think that we might have to look, look at this a little bit more. Maybe some of us need to go out and actually meet with the, uh, the applicant on site. Um, and just see yeah, that's what I was thinking was going out there. Yeah, so if one uh -huh. of you would like to make a motion that we move this meeting. I will, I will make that motion, yes. What's that date, uh, Phil? October 4th. October 4th. Okay. A motion to move to... Uh... All right. Can I get a second on that? I'll second that. Okay. Uh, Jessica, can we get a roll call, please? Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Heath? Yes. Commissioner Hughes? Yes. Chairperson Vanden Eickhoff? Yes. Motion passes. And just a reminder, that's a motion to continue to a date certain October 4th. And to all those listening tonight, um, that will be the date. We'll have another agenda out, but we will not be doing another legal notice on this since we've continued to a date certain. So just wanted to remind everyone. Um, and um, we will go from there. Thank you. Appreciate everybody who participated in this. We have a lot to think about. Um, and I think that giving us a little cooling off time will allow us to think it through a little better. So um, thank you, everyone. We'll go ahead and move to our director's report, please, Phil. Thank you, Chair. Well, we hope that uh, we can have a better quorum in the future with commissioners. Um, it's definitely, we're going to continue seeing a few items. And as we get into our general plan, it's going to be quite critical. And that's probably our next big project um, happening. I keep bringing this up. We're going to make a presence at the Colony Days Parade. I think we're going to be in the parade, actually, just kind of letting people know what's going on. So keep an eye out for that. Other projects we have going on, uh, we are discussing with our city council right now a project called Objective Design Standards. And at their next hearing next Tuesday, a week from today, we'll be talking to them about these potential design standards that we can utilize for multifamily residential and mixed-use projects. And ultimately, th that set of standards will come before the Design Review Committee and the, and the uh, Planning Commission before it goes to City Council for adoption. But they're giving us some early feedback on that right now, and we have a consultant presenting that uh, matter to the Council next Tuesday. Um, other items uh, that I should mention, the ADU and Senate Bill 9 items that you reviewed did go to city council. They did pass SB9. However, they continued the accessory dwelling discussion uh, and we'll be picking that up again at, at the city council on October 11th. They wanted to make some small tweaks to um, potentially the unit size and um, uh, played with some other language. And we had some typos in, in some of the ordinances. So it's coming back for another quick look. So we should be completed with that, but SB9 actually did get its first reading and it's gonna go for second reading and will be adopted. So good work everyone on that. 
Um, and if you have any questions about other development projects or other policy making in the city, I'd be happy to answer your questions. I got a question. So um, was there any update on the uh, Del Rio progress? So there's several projects at Del Rio. You might be, um, I'm assuming you're referring to the Del Rio marketplace, which is where yeah. the market uh, that's being developed there, which is the Valley Fresh Market, that is in construction permit review right now. Okay. And we'll be moving forward. So his hope is to actually be under construction as soon as possible on that site. So it's happening. At the same time that you notice they're working across the street on the location where the Taco Bell is going and we're still okay. processing a, a permit for a fuel station over there and another potential restaurant site on the other side of the street. But we're also working on a very big project since we're talking about Del Rio, a big project called Barrel Creek on the other side of the freeway. And we're doing the environmental studies on that right now. And that ultimately will be coming before the planning commission at some point in the next few months. So, okay. I, I also just wanted to mention real quick while we're in a public hearing and some people are listening that there will be uh, some road closures planned partially at Del Rio and El Camino starting tomorrow night. Um, it is a night closure. So they're hoping to get work done during the evening hours and get the road open um, by Thursday morning, but it will be at Del Rio and El Camino Wednesday night into Thursday morning starting at eight o'clock Thursday night or Wednesday. And that's that little area right next to where they're building those new buildings for the Taco Bell and a location where they're essentially widening part of uh, Del Rio. That's great. Uh, Phil, what's going on? What happened with the um, the camps ground that was right next to Barrel Creek? Weren't they under, didn't they get building permits and weren't they going to move forward on that or it's moving forward slowly that's actually an interesting project because they're permitted by the state of california because they're essentially a modular home installation they're not really homes but they're going to be lodging units um and so it's all for the most part approved by the city they're having to work out some wrinkles in the public improvements over the last few weeks because there's a sewer line that they've got to do and there's some frontage improvements they've got to do and at the same time, we're weighing those improvements uh, in comparison with the improvements that need to occur for Barrel Creek. And so um, there's been a lot of evaluation going on there. I think we finally got it nailed down, uh, but the applicant's going to hold off, I think, for a few more weeks and, and hopefully get started here soon. But um, yeah, that project's still on the table and still happening. Great. And while we're still in that neighborhood, what about the old Walmart site? It's kind of sitting idle right now. They got their preliminary concept approvals and they haven't come back for a final sort of master plan of development to do anything there. And so we're waiting to see what might happen next on that, but no news on that right now. Any other qu questions from our planning commissioners? Okay. If not, we will go ahead and adjourn and we'll meet again at our next scheduled meeting on October 4th. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you.